Hello friends and welcome to Storytime. My name is Miss Maureen and today we are going to be doing things a little bit differently than normal because today we're talking about indigenous people of Maine. Since none of the cultures we will be reading about today are mine, it would be unfair of me to pretend that I understand all of the important things about them when I don't. So today I will mostly be just reading you books, but not so many of the little activities that we normally do in between stories. I would like to start off by singing our hello song and our ABCs. When we sing hello, we will do a salute, and when we sing friends, we'll take our first two fingers and have them give each other a hug. Hello, friends. Hello, friends. Hello, friends. It's time to say hello. Good job, guys. So we're not going to be learning any American Sign Language today, but we will have the chance to learn some words in a couple other languages throughout story time. So let's jump right to our ABCs. If you want to sing them along with me, please do. If you don't feel like singing, you can go ahead and pat your knees to the rhythm, or you can try to sign along with me. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Now I know my ABCs. Next time, won't you sing with me? Good job! Before we go into our first book, I want to show all of you a map. Do you know what this is a map of? Yeah, it's a map of Maine. This map shows the original inhabitants of the place that we now call Maine. All the way up at the top here lived the Maliseet. At the little nose of Maine were the Passamaquoddy. In the center, the Penobscot. And over here, down in the south and on the west, were the Abenaki. There were also the Mi'kmaq people who lived in Maine, but many of them migrated to Ohio when the Europeans came. Why don't we learn how to say hello in the three original languages of Maine? So all of the languages that were spoken in the place we call Maine today were part of the Algonquin family. There was Abenaki Penobscot, spoken by the Abenaki and Penobscot peoples. There was Maliseet Passamaquoddy, spoken by the Maliseet and Passamaquoddy people, and there was Mi'kmaq. So why don't we learn how to say hello in those three languages? So I have them written on here. To say hello in Abenaki Penobscot, you say kwai. Kwai. Can you try? Kwai. To say hello in Malasi Passamaquoddy, you say Tancock. 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 And to say hello in Micmac, it's Quay. Quay. Quay, friends. So now you can say hello in four different languages that are spoken in Maine. You can say hello in English, hello. You can say hello in Abenaki Penobscot, kwai. You can say hello in Maliseet Passamaquoddy, tancock. And you can say hello in Micmac, kwai. Do you know where Elliot is on this map? Elliot is where the library lives. Hmm. Elliot is all the way down here very bottom of Maine. The original inhabitants of Elliot were the Abenaki people. Our first book today is retold by father and son Abenaki storytellers, 
Joseph and James Bruchak, and it's called Raccoon's Last Race. Raccoon's Last Race, as told by Joseph Bruchak and James Bruchak. Raccoon's Last Race, a traditional Abenaki story. Long ago, Raccoon did not look the way he does today. Whoa. Back then, Asban the Raccoon had very long legs and was a fast runner. In fact, he was the fastest of all the animals. Because of this, he liked nothing better than to challenge the other animals to a race. With his long legs, he would always win. He would race bear, zip zip, he would beat bear. He would race fox, zip zip, he would beat fox. He would race rabbit, zip zip, he would beat rabbit. Asban the raccoon also liked to taunt the other animals. While racing, he would turn his head back to look at his competitor and he would sing, he he he, look at me. I am Asban, I am fast. Look at you, ho ho ho, you are very, very slow. As you might imagine, this didn't please the other animals. After a while, none would accept Asban's challenges. In fact, they even refused to speak to him because he was always trying to taunt them into racing again. This didn't stop him. He began to play tricks on the other animals. He would hide in a tree, and when the animals walked by, he would jump down and frighten them. Because Asban was so fast, no one could ever catch him. One day, Asban noticed someone sitting on top of a tall hill. Perhaps I can play a trick on that one. Perhaps I can challenge him to a race, Asban said. He quickly ran to the top of the hill. But when he got there, he discovered that it was not an animal at all. It was a big rock. This did not stop Asban. He loved to talk, especially about himself. Grandfather, are you a fast runner? He asked. I am Asban. I am the fastest of all the animals. To Asban's surprise, Big Rock spoke back. In a deep voice, it said, No, grandson. I do not travel, I just sit here. You should try it, grandfather, Asban said. Grandson, Big Rock said, I do not want to travel. I have been here for a long, long time. That is how it will always be. Asban smiled. Maybe not, grandfather, I will help you. Then Asban got behind Big Rock and began to push and push. As he did so, the rock began to wobble back and forth. Thump, 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 thump. Asban pushed harder and harder. Kaboom! The rock fell over on its side and began to roll. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom! It rolled on down that hill. Aha, grandfather, Asban shouted. Now you are traveling. As Big Rock rolled down the hill, Asban quickly caught up and ran alongside. How do you like it? He asked, and Big Rock answered, Kaboom! 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 Well, as that rock rolled down that hill, it naturally began to pick up speed. Yippee! thought Asban. This rock is trying to challenge me to a race. I will show it a thing or two. Running as fast as he could, Asban the raccoon flew past the rock that was rolling. Kaboom! Kaboom! Down the hill. He began to zigzag in front of Big Rock while turning around and taunting. Ha ha! You are very slow, Grandfather. I, Asban, am very fast. But Asban 
and turned his head to taunt that rock one time too many. Not looking where he was going, he tripped, kathunk, and fell on the ground right in front of Big Rock. Since the rock had never been traveling before, it didn't know how to stop. Instead, it went kaboom, kaboom, splat, kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. On and on the rock traveled, enjoying itself quite a bit. And there lay Asban the raccoon, rolled so flat and wide by the rock that he could not move his arms or legs or even his head. All he could move were his lips. Help me, somebody please help me, he said in a small flattened out voice. But no one seemed to hear Asban's cry for help. Or maybe, remembering all the tricks he had played, they did hear and pretended not to notice. There skipped by, but didn't stop to help. Fox trotted by, but didn't stop to help. Rabbit, kabunk, kabunk, hopped right over him, appeared not even to notice, didn't stop to help. One by one, just about every animal in the forest passed Asban by. Asban began to think he would be lying there forever. Then, towards the end of the day, one of the smallest creatures walked by, one of the ants. Walking right on top of him, he looked down at Asban's flattened out face and asked, How can I help you? Everyone says that we ants are good for nothing. Asban had hoped for someone a little bigger than an ant, but he looked up and said, Oh no, I think you ants are wonderful. Please go get all of your sisters and brothers and cousins and help pull me back into shape. If you do, I promise that I'll always be your friend. Now, it's not easy being an ant. With other creatures always kicking you around, not even noticing you. With a friend as big as Asban, the ant thought, maybe everyone will show us a little more respect. I will help, said the ant, but remember your promise. Yes, yes, of course, said Asban. Now hurry up and get back here with the others. And so the ant went back to his village. Hear me, he said. Asban the Great has promised he will always be our friend if we help pull him back into shape. The ants agreed that it would be good to have a friend as big as Asban. And so before long, all of the ants, thousands of them, gathered around the raccoon and began to do something that they do very well. Work together. Those ants pulled and pushed and pulled and pushed. They began putting Asban back into shape. Soon, Asban the raccoon could move. He stood up, and as he did so, he saw that many of the ants were still clinging to his body. Instead of being grateful for what they had done, he just brushed them off and said, Horrible little ants. He began to walk away without even saying thank you. However, after only a few steps, he noticed something. His legs were very short. His body was still quite wide. He had brushed those ants off before they had finished stretching him out. But having broken his promise, he knew that the ants would never agree to finish the job. Instead, Raccoon had to learn to accept being the short, squatty animal he is to this day. and he is certainly not a fast runner. The end. The next story I'm gonna tell you, I am taking from the book, Pushing Up the Sky, Seven Native American Plays for Children. This is also by Joseph Bruchak, who remember was one of the storytellers from the first book we read. So the story I'm, I'm reading from Pushing Up the Sky is about Gluskabe, who is an Abenaki hero. And this story is about Gluskabe and Old Man Winter. 
I'm going to read this little paragraph here that Joseph Bruchak leads the play with just to get you an idea of where the story is set. Buscabe and Old Man Winter, Abenaki. The homeland of the Abenaki people is the area now known as Northern New England, where the winters can be very cold. The Abenakis lived in small villages near the rivers, which were their highways. Their birch bark covered homes were called wigwams and were shaped like domes or large cones. Their seasonal round of life would find them fishing at the rivers or the seashore in the spring and summer and hunting for deer, moose, and caribou in the woods in the autumn and winter. Their fields of corn, beans, squash, and other plants were grown in the river valleys and at the edges of the big lakes. Today, many Abenaki people still live in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, and Abenaki children still love to hear stories of Guscabe's clever tricks. Long ago, Guscabe lived with his grandmother, Woodchuck, and at this time, it was Guscabe's job to help the people. At this point, it had been winter for a very long time and it was very cold and the snow was very high. Buscabe and his grandmother were talking about this and how it was a problem when a human came to Grandmother Woodchuck's wigwam and knocked. After they greeted each other, quiet, quiet, the human says to Buscabe, I come on behalf of the human beings. This winter is too cold. It is too long, and if it goes on for much longer, we won't be able to survive. We need your help. Buscabe thinks about this and he says, Yes, I will help you. I will go to Old Man Winter's wigwam and I will tell him that he needs to go back to his home in the north. Grandmother Woodchuck is a little nervous. She warns Guscabe to be careful, but he says, Don't worry, Grandmother. The winter can't hurt me. And so off he goes to Old Man Winter's wigwam. When he gets there, he knocks. Who is it? says a voice from inside. It is Guscabe. Come in and sit by my fire. So Guscabe enters Old Man Winter's wigwam. And he sees a fire, but it is not a fire of flames. It's a fire of ice. Still, Guscabe sits down beside Old Man Winter's fire. He says to the old man, the people are suffering. You have been here too long. It is time for winter to leave. You must go back to your home in the north. Oh, must I, eh? Says Old Man Winter. Tell me, do you like my fire? Buscabe looks at the fire, which is not really a fire, and he says, I do not like your fire. It is not warm. It is cold. And Old Man Winter says, It is cold because it's made of ice, and so are you. And he turns Buscabe into ice. He pushes the ice block that is Guscabe out of his wigwam and he goes back to sit by his ice fire. But even though it's winter and even though it's so cold, the sun still comes up to shine. And when it does, it melts all the ice around Guscabe. And he sits up and he mm, stretches and he says, well, that was a nice nap, but I am not going back into that old man winter's wigwam not until I've spoken to my grandmother. So he goes back to his grandmother. She is there and she's cold and she says, Guscabe, it is still winter. Would old man winter not talk with you? Guscabe answers, we talked, but he would not listen. But I will make him listen. But first grandmother, I must know, where does the warm weather come from? she tells him, it 
comes from the land of the summer people in the south. But they are very dangerous. And he says, well, what's so dangerous about them? I must go get this warm weather. Well, she says, they only have one eye and they are very greedy. They do not want to share their warm weather with anyone. They keep it in a giant pot in the center and they dance around it. And watching from four corners are four crows. If anyone takes any of the summer sticks from that pot of warm weather, the crows will fly down and pluck off their heads. Hmm. Kuskabe thinks about this and he says, I will wear an eye mask so that it looks like I too have only one eye. And I will bring these four balls of sinew with me. So he packs his bag and he heads south to the Summerlands. When he gets there, he puts on his eye patch and he sees the Summerland people dancing around the pot full of warm weather. And he sees the four crows standing guard and he approaches. The Summerland people stop dancing and walk to him. They are suspicious. Hmm, who are you? Oh, I am one of you, says Buscabe. See, I only have one eye just like you. Hmm, I don't recognize you. Oh, says Buscabe. Well, I've been gone for a long time, but I'm back now. Hmm. And then finally, one of the Summerland people looks at Gluskabe and he says, let's welcome him back. Come and dance with us. So Gluskabe joins in on their dance around the pot of warm weather. And as he's dancing with them, he gets closer to the pot. And when he's close enough to reach in, he grabs a summer stick and he runs for it. The summer people are in a frenzy and they are shouting, he took our summer stick, grab him. He's not one of us, crows, get his head. But Guskabe was ready for this. So as the first crow dives towards Guskabe's head, Guskabe pulls out one of the balls of sinew and he ducks his head and puts the ball where his head should be. So when that crow flies down, he plucks the ball of sinew. Caw, caw, he cries. I have got his head. But Gluskabe is still running. So the second crow makes ready to dive down. Gluskabe pulls a second ball of sinew from his pack, ducks his head and puts the ball in the place of his head. So the crow dives down and plucks the ball of sinew from his hand. Caw, caw, no, I have his head. But Gluskabe is still running. So the third crow gets ready to dive down. And Gluskabe pulls out the third ball of sinew. He ducks his head and puts the ball where his head should be. So when the crow dives down, he plucks the ball of sinew. Caw, caw, look, look, I've got his head. But Gluskabe is still running. So the fourth crow gets ready to dive down towards his head. Gluskabe pulls the last ball of sinew out ducks his head and puts the ball where his head should be. And the last crow dies down and grabs the ball of sinew. Caw, caw! Look, look! It is me! I have his head! But Gluskabe was still running. How many heads does this guy have? Says the chief of the summer people. And then he realizes, Oh! He tricked us! But it's too late. Gluskabe is gone. So the summer people do the only thing they can, and they begin dancing again. Meanwhile, Guskabe heads back to Old Man Winter's wigwam. When he gets there, he knocks on the door. Who is it? Guskabe. Come in, says Old Man Winter. So Guskabe enters, this time holding a summer stick. He sits down at Old Man Winter's fire places the summer stick in front of him. You must go back to your home in the north, he tells Old Man Winter again. Oh, must I, eh? says Old Man Winter. But tell me, how do you like my fire? Guskabe looks at the fire and he says, your fire is warming. 
Your wigwam is melting. You are growing weaker. Go back to the north. Old Man Winter looks around and he sees that it's true. His fire is warming. His wigwam is melting. He is growing weaker. No, it can't be. I can't be defeated. Muscabe looks at him as he continues to melt everything around him. You have been defeated, old man, he says. Go back to the north. And so, old man Winter goes back to his home in the north. There's nothing else he can do. So Gluskabe defeated Old Man Winter. He saved the people from the long, long cold, and he brought back spring. But because he only brought back one summer stick, the winter still returns every year. But thanks to Gluskabe, the spring is always right behind. Our last book is called Thanks to the Animals. This one is by a Passamaquoddy author named Alan J. Saka Basin. Do you remember where the Passamaquoddy land is on Maine? Right here at the nose. And the Passamaquoddy still have two reservations right here at the tip. As you might be able to tell from the cover and from the title of this book, there are lots of animals in this story. So why don't we learn the Maliseet Passamaquoddy names of some of the animals that we will be seeing in the book. But before we learn how to say the names of the animals in Maliseet Passamaquoddy, I need your help remembering what they're called in English. Do you think you can help me name the animals? Let's try it. Ooh. What animal is this? Hmm. This is one you probably see all over your yard, climbing up the trees, maybe even climbing up onto your house. It's a squirrel. To say squirrel in Maliseet Passamaquoddy, you say Mikku. Mikku. Can you try it? Mikku. Squirrel. Miku. Good job. Ooh, what about this one? He's a little cutie. I bet you see them sometimes, but they get spooked kind of easily, so sometimes they're hiding. Who is this friend? He's a rabbit. To say rabbit in Maliseet Passamaquoddy, you say Ma'art Teguas. Ma'art teguas. Can you try? I'll say it a little slower. Ma'art teguas. Ma'art teguas. Rabbit. Ma'art teguas. Good job. Let's see who we have next. Ooh. Do you know what this animal is? I've never seen one of these in the wild, but I know that they're out there. It's a moose. Can you guess what the Malisee Passamaquoddy word for moose is? Hmm. You might think it's really hard to guess, but it turns out that the Malisee Passamaquoddy word for moose is moose. When the Europeans came to the Americas, they had never seen a moose before, so they had no idea what to call it. So. They borrowed the English word for moose from the Algonquin speakers in America. Oh, who's this little guy? He's super cute, but if you have chickens, you might not like the looks of them. Hmm. Who is he? It's a fox. Have you ever seen a fox in your yard? Maybe not, because they like to come out at night. They're sneaky. To say fox in Maliseet Passamaquoddy, we say quaxus. Quaxus. Fox. Quaxus. Can you try? 
Quaxus. Good job. I have one more animal for us. Ooh, who is this big guy? I've never seen one of these in the woods either, but I do know that they're out there and I'm kind of grateful that I've never run into one before. Who's this? It's a bear. Do you say bear in Maliseet Passamaquoddy? You say mooey, mooey, bear. Mooey. Can you try? Mooey. Mooey. Good job. Now you can say hello in pa Maliseet Passamaquoddy as well as Abenaki Penobscot and Micmac. And you know how to say the names of five main animals in Maliseet Passamaquoddy. If you check the description of the story time, I'm also going to link to a couple different websites where you can learn even more words in all these languages and also more stories and just lots of really amazing interesting facts about the original inhabitants of Maine so I really encourage you to explore those but first let's read our last book Thanks to the Animals by Alan J. Sakabasin Thanks to the Animals by Alan Sockabasin. Thanks to the Animals. Winter had arrived. Ju Tum worked for days preparing for the trip north with his family. He took apart their house near the shore and stacked the cedar logs on the big bobsled. Everyone helped. They packed the family sled with his tools and with the meats and fish and vegetables harvested during the summer when the days were long. It was loaded to the very top with precious food, but Jutam made sure there was room for his children to ride in the back. Everyone dressed in warm sealskin clothes for the long trip. It was time to go to their winter home in the deep woods. The horses pulled the sled slowly through the new snow. Zusap was not yet walking, but he was a strong baby, born in the spring. He rode on the sled with the other children. As the shadows grew long, the older children slept. But then little Zoo Sap stood up and tumbled off the sled. Oh, how Zoo Sap cried. His voice filled the sky. Poor baby. The animals of the forest were alerted by his crying. First to come were the beaver. They knew they had to keep him warm and dry. So they put their tails together and cradled Zusap. Who else is coming? Zusap still cried, so the moose came, then the bear, the caribou, and the deer. The fox and the wolf came too, and all the big animals lay together in a circle. Then the other smaller animals came, the raccoons, porcupines, the rabbits, weasels, and mink. The muskrat and otter and the squirrels and mice came too. They gathered and filled in the cracks between the big animals. At sunset, the owl came. Then the raven, crow, jay, duck, and a goose gathered to perch on top. Even a seagull came. Last came the great bald eagle, who spread her wings over the other birds and animals. Zusap stayed warm.
When Jutam arrived at his winter home, he knew something was very wrong. Zusap was missing. Jutam quickly lit a fire for his family and got them settled. Then he turned back to the trail to find his son. He traveled through the woods all night, and just at sunrise, he came to a big mound of snow. Resting on top was the great bald eagle. Is that a mound of snow? What is that? I knew you would come back for zoo sap, the eagle said. Jutum looked down and saw his son safely sleeping in a great pile of warm animals. Jutum thanked the animals one by one. Then he took Zusap in his strong arms and went back to the family. When they arrived that evening, there was feasting and dancing. What a celebration. The end. In the back of the book here, there's a list of all of the animals that are seen in this book. And the Maliseet Passamaquoddy words for each of them. These are written phonetically, so that's not how they're spelt, just how they're pronounced. If you'd like to hear that story read in Passamaquoddy by the author, Alan J. Sakabasin, I will be linking to that video in the description as well as a video of James Bruchak telling a different Gluskabe tale, which I encourage you to listen to. And like I said before, there are lots of other links in the description to help you explore more about the cultures of the first peoples of Maine. But that's it for story time today, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. I will be seeing you next week. I do have a little activity for us to do after this, so please stick around if you're interested. If you have any questions about our in-person story times, you can email me at the email listed below. Otherwise, please find us on Facebook and on Instagram and our website, which is experiencing some troubles right now, but generally is a great place to get information. So you can be the first to know about all the things that are going on in the Kentrum and at the library in general. Why don't we sing our goodbye song? It's quite simple. We're just going to wave and clap. We wave goodbye like this. We wave goodbye like this. We clap our hands for all our friends and wave goodbye like this. Goodbye, friends. So for this craft, you're going to need either a couple sheets of printer paper or a sheet of cardstock paper and You'll need some scissors, something to color with, string or yarn, glue, a pencil, and some tin foil. Okay, for this craft, you're going to make a ball and triangle game. It's a traditional Native American game. And if you're using the PDF printout, you can find the link to it in the description of this video. This is what it looks like. If you have a printer or access to a printer, you can just print out some of these sheets. It's best to do this with thick paper like cardstock if you have access to it. You can cut out the printer paper and trace the cardstock. But if you don't have cardstock, what I did, I just printed out two copies with the printer paper. I'm going to cut them out individually and glue them together to make them a little thicker. If you're not using the PDF, you'll just need a pencil, something straight to trace with, and a piece of paper. Again, ideally a thick piece of paper like cardstock or just a couple layers of computer paper. If you are tracing on your own, you can use your straight edge, like a ruler, to Draw a triangle. Triangles can be a little difficult to get the angle right, but it doesn't have to be perfect. So 
So I have my triangle and I'm just going to draw a line on each of the edges like that. And then I want to fold my paper along the top edge. And now I'm going to, with the paper folded, cut out along the lines. There we go. And then again, if you're using computer paper, I would trace this and cut out a second one. And then the last step would just be drawing a circle in the middle and make sure those are all lined up as well so while keeping it folded gonna pinch it cut out a little bit and then cut out the circle and when you trace your second piece you can just make sure to trace the circle as well so that they all stay lined up with each other. But I'm not going to use this one. I'm going to use the triangle from the printout. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing. Just cut along the outside edges. Make sure not to cut in between there. And then I'm going to cut out the circles and I'm going to do that on both of my sheets. Now we're going to attach our string. If you have a hole punch, you can just go ahead and glue your pieces together like so, stack them up and glue them to a layer like that and then glue the insides and fold it up. And then you can take your hole punch, punch a hole in one of the corners and tie your string around the outer edge. But I'm going to do it a little differently. I'm going to take my two pieces of paper and I'm going to glue them together like this. So I need to get my glue stick. And try to line it up the best you can. glued together. Now I want to poke a hole right in the center where they're connected. You can use a sharp pencil, pen, maybe an awl if you have one. Ask for a parent to help you if you want because sometimes it can be delicate work. And things could end up ripping. Okay. Oh man. Okay. So, I've got my little hole. And now I need a piece of string. If your string is bigger, if you're using yarn, you might want to make your hole a little wider. Make it however big you need it to be. Okay. So I'm gonna cut about a foot of string. You might want it a little longer or a little shorter. And I'm gonna thread this through. I want the knot that I make to be on the inside that I fold closed. So I have my little piece sticking through to the inside and I'm going to tie a knot. Oops. Okay. I'm going to 
to double knot it just to make it a little extra thick there, but it's okay if the knot's a little smaller than the hole because we are going to be gluing the string down for extra measure. All right, so I have that in there with the knot. Now I'm going to glue all of this together. Again, try to line it up the best you can. the base part of our game. Now at this point you can go ahead and decorate your triangle, your plank, however you want. I'm gonna use some markers to make a couple designs on mine. Okay, so here's my little design. Nothing too fancy. Now the last thing we need to do is attach a ball for our game. So you might have big beads at your house that you can use, um, or maybe you have some salt dough, you can make some salt dough and make a bead, but if you don't want to do either, if you don't have a bead or if you don't want to take the extra step of making one, you can use some tin foil. It's not going to be the prettiest, but... It'll be fun. So you don't need too much because we want to make sure our ball is just a little smaller than the hole in there. I'm going to start off with just a tiny little piece and we can always add more if we have to. So I am going to try to make my ball around the end of the string here. And if you want, you can add some glue to help keep it secure. So I didn't need any more than that piece. I could make it a little bigger, I think, but I don't want it to be too hard. That's pretty perfect. And now it's time to play. So to play, you just grab one of the corners and try to bounce the ball into the circle. Oh, with such a with a lighter ball, it might be easier to actually use a shorter string. So keep that in mind, but challenge is good. <laughs> I got it! Well, have fun with your ball and triangle games. Maybe you can even make some in a bunch of different sizes and them out. Have a little contest. See who can get the most in a row. Thanks guys. Have fun.